Welcome to the Braver Angels podcast, a new way of talking politics. I'm your host, Kieran O'Connor. My guest today is Barbara Walter, an author, academic, and political scientist who currently teaches at the University of California in San Diego. Barbara specializes in studying civil wars, terrorism, and political violence. And she's out with a new book, a New York Times bestseller, in fact, called How Civil Wars Start and How to Stop Them. Barbara's book examines various civil wars around the world and tries to tease out where wars tend to start, who initiates them, what triggers them, and why some countries tip into war while others remain stable. At a time when political polarization in the United States appears to be increasingly fueling violence, I wanted to bring Barbara on to discuss the current state of political violence in America, where she thinks we're headed on our current trajectory, who and what might bear responsibility, what America can learn from other countries, and how we together as citizens can take a stand for peace. Barbara, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. It is great to have you, and I'm excited to get into the book. But before we do, I'd just to love to hear first, why did you decide to come on this podcast? <laughs> so I've heard of this organization. In fact, I, I mentioned the organization in the book um, in the last chapter when I'm talking about possible solutions. Um, and um, the, the solutions are based on what the preconditions of civil war are. So it's the flip side of what gets us into trouble. Um, if you fix that, you get yourself out of trouble. And, and one of those factors is um, what, what um, political scientists call ethnic factionalism. When, when populations break down along ethnic, religious, and racial lines in their politics. And so in the last chapter, I'm talking about how do you bridge this divide? And I talk about the grassroots organizations that have sprung up around the United States to address um, many of these issues that all of us are worried about. And, and Better Angels is really extraordinary in that it's, it's, um, it, it's not interested in, in politics per se, it's really interested in bringing people from the left and the right together to, um, to show them that their humanity, to, to make people realize that they actually have far more in common than, than they have um, uh, not. And, and to, yeah, to really build a sense of community. And so I, I'm on the podcast because I think what this organization is doing is not only tremendous work, but it's, it's really important work that needs to be done and, and speaks directly to one of the issues that, that experts of civil war knows actually is, is quite dangerous and destructive. Hmm. Well, we're happy to have you because I think your work can shed light on the issues we are working on and help us think about the consequences of political division. You mentioned ethnic factionalism. Yeah. I know you've studied civil wars in various places, Iraq, Ukraine, Sri yeah. Lanka. What are some of the other common threads you've seen and some of the warning signs that have emerged that we might pay attention to here in the United States? Yeah, so I think one of the things that most people don't know is that there's a whole kind of um, team of civil war experts here in the United States, around the world, um, who've been compiling data on civil wars for decades. We have an enormous amount of scholarship on what the risk factors and the warning signs of civil wars are. The, that scholarship, those studies, those data are, are kind of hidden away at university, universities and, and think tanks. Um, it doesn't tend to get out into the public realm in part because it's massive and nobody wants to weed through them in part because they tend to be quite technical and they're hard to kind of uh, access. But there's so much information um, that we have. In addition to that, another thing that most Americans don't know is that our own government has had a task force 
called the Task Force on Political Instability um, that studies the risk factors associated with the outbreak of political violence and civil wars. And that task force has existed since 1994. Now, your listeners are probably wondering, why does the US have such a task force? Well, our government is really interested in trying to predict what countries around the world are likely to descend into violence. And they want to know this before violence actually happens because they want to have a chance to do something about it. They'd much rather have a stable, peaceful country um, than, a, than a country that, that collapses and unravels into violence. Um, and so I was asked to join this task force in uh, 2017. And every year we get together about four times in a conference room in a hotel in Northern Virginia. Um, and the room would be filled half with, with civil war experts, academics like me, and half with data analysts who were in charge of building this predictive model. And the academics would come and they would say, listen, you know, here's, here are all the new studies on civil wars. Here's what we're, we've learned um, recently. Here are the things that seem to matter. And when the model was initially created, um, uh, the data analysts included I think about 38 different factors. It was kind of the kitchen sink to, okay, here's everything we suspect or think might have some effect on civil war, things like poverty, things like income inequality, how ethnically and religiously diverse a country is. Um, and the data analysts played with all of these many factors until they came, to, came down to um, the factors that best predicted the outbreak of, of political violence and civil war. And it turns out only two of them did. And so they came back to the conference room, one of, the, one of our meetings, and we were just shocked. Uh, you know, uh, even the experts wouldn't have predicted it would have come down to really just two. Um, and those two factors were something that we call anocracy. Anocracy. That's a kind of a fancy term for governments that are neither fully democratic nor fully autocratic. There's something in between. So these can be democracies that are kind of declining, um, where they're becoming less democratic over time, or it could be autocracies that are becoming more. They're they're democratizing. Um, it turns out that civil wars um, almost always happen in this middle zone. Um, full, democ full healthy democracies almost never experience civil wars. Full autocracies almost never experience civil wars. It's all happening in the middle. And then the second factor is what I mentioned earlier, which is ethnic factionalism. It's when um, populations in these anocracies begin to organize their political parties, not around ideas. So are you, <clears throat> are you conservative? Are you, do you believe in big government or small government? It's when they predominantly organize around identity. So you start to have racial political parties, religious political parties, ethnic political parties. And then these factions, when they're, they're aiming to gain power <clears throat> Um, to exclude everybody else. So it's a different form of kind of ugly, tribal, um, you know, bare knuckles um, politics. Um, those, if, if a country had those two features, um, the task force would put them on something called the watch list. They were considered at high risk of political violence. And that watch list was sent to the White House for their, uh, for whatever they wanted to do with it. Um, and so, of course, if you think about those two factor, factors, you have a weak and declining democracy, you have, you know, um, political parties based on race and religion, um, and you think about the United States, those two features have been evolving here in the United States, and they've been evolving relatively rapidly, especially since 2016. Hmm. Are there instances in which you think political violence is justified? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, wars have been used historically to right some of the worst wrongs, to depose some of the worst governments, um, to prevent even worse atrocities from, from happening. 
Um, if, you know, think about the, the, the American Civil War, you know, in the absence of a President Lincoln saying, we will not allow the South to secede. Um, his decision to go to war with the South, as opposed to simply allowing them to create their own country, um, eliminated slavery from the United States. Slavery would have continued for who, you know, who knows how long, for a very long time in the absence of that. If you think about World War II, um, you know, if Britain and France and, and the United States um, had not gotten involved in World War II, had not fought that war, it's very likely um, you know, that, that um, Adolf Hitler could have succeeded in taking control of, of not just the European continent, but, um, but Russia and perhaps the Far, far East as, as well. And, and, um, and, and that would have been a rule of white supremacy. It would have led to, it would have led to the deaths of, of, of you know, who knows how many, um, you know, tens and hundreds of millions of people. Hmm. And so is there a heuristic or framework that you use to think about when violence becomes morally justified? Is there a heuristic? Um, uh, no, but there are really good political scientists who taught who who spent their career doing this with and and um, if if your listeners are interested in um, just Google a just war. So that's the terminology mm. that's used. When is war uh, just um, justified? Um, and it's 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 thought of in both in terms of wars against another country. When is that justified? But also um, wars within countries, and and I, I this is just a hunch. I'm going to throw this out there on the fly, but my my sense is that there's probably a higher percentage of civil wars that ultimately could be considered just than interstate wars because um, the, the people who usually initiate civil wars are are the citizens with deep grievances against their government. They're being treated really poorly. Um, the status quo has become unbearable for various reasons. And, and so they see their only path forward as turning to violence um, and, and deposing and replacing the existing government. And they will often do this at enormous cost to themselves. Um, the having said that, there, there are you know, many, many civil wars where um, you know, the, the motivation behind the group that has started the war is absolutely not justified. They're doing it for very selfish, self-serving reasons. And oftentimes, if you look to see who, who their leaders are, it's their leaders that are actually um, fomenting unrest um, it's their leaders who are who are engaging in things like xenophobia and fear mongering um, as a means to catapult themselves to political power. Um, and once they have political power, they often rule um, quite oppressively um, themselves. So, um, so you, you know, you see a gamut with civil wars. But but one of the one of the interesting things that the research has shown especially when you have wars that break down along ethnic um, or racial lines within a country, is, is that we actually have a very good idea who tends to start these wars. Um, and um, it's, it's often not the poorest groups in society. It's often not the most discriminated groups in society. It's almost never immigrants in a country um, who, who oftentimes have lots of good reasons to be angry. Um, they tend to be quite passive. The groups that tend to start ethnic civil wars are the groups that had once been politically and socially dominant, but are in decline. Um, and so they tend to start wars because they see power slipping through their fingers. They see the rise of another demographic um, group um, they, they can project into the future. Um, they can see that if they do nothing, they will eventually become a minority and what they believe is rightfully their own country. And they often have the capacity and the power this is, that they've had and that they still have vestiges of to, to organize a movement to use violence to, to ensure that they maintain control, political power into the future, even if their numbers are declining. Mm. And do you feel that 
one side of the political spectrum in the United States has been making more excuses for violence than the other? Well, it's so interesting because I come at this as a social scientist. So, um, you know, I, I've studied, there've been about uh, 250 civil wars since the end of World War II, since 1946. And I've studied every single one of them. And, and you start to see patterns. Um, and so when I started writing this book, um, you know, one of the big patterns was that it's these declining, it's these once politically powerful groups, the, <clears throat> the groups that had, you know, feel that we call them sons of the soil. They feel like they are the sons of, the, of, of a particular territory. It's their territory. Um, and so when I, you know, I simply took that finding, that empirical finding that we have in the literature. And I looked at the United States and I said, okay, if the United States has a son of the soil, who is it? I mean, I mean the, the first response would be, well, it's actually Native Americans. They were the first ones who were here. They were a majority before Europeans began to arrive, but they've essentially been eradicated. So they almost don't exist anymore. And they certainly are such a tiny, tiny minority that they, they have lost the battle you know, eons ago. Um, so if it's not the Native Americans who, you know, who has been the son of the soil, the sons of the soil here in the United States since the inception of the United States of America. And it has been white Christians. And in fact, you could take it one step further. It's been white Christian men who, who really were the recipients of, of power and social status and, and economic um, uh, status and power, um, you know, since the 17, since the 1700s. And, um, and so if, you know, I first started to say, well, you know, there are sons of the soil, are they behaving the way other sons of the soils have behaved in places like the Philippines and India, and Northern Ireland? Um, and, and are they in a structural situation where they would begin to act out? And the structural situation is decline. You know, are they becoming a smaller and smaller percentage of the population in their country? Mm, yes, they are. Um, are they losing um, political power relative to other rising groups? Mm, yes, they are. Um, are they, um, you know, are they no longer guaranteed to, to get the most elite spots in the most elite elite universities, the best jobs and the best law firms? Um, you know, the most high paying positions in, in the finance industry. Well, you know, that is declining as well. Huh? Well, check, 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 check. Um, this to me seems like a classic case of, of a sons of the soil dynamic. Um, and, and then if you look to see what's happened since about 2008 in terms of like who is organizing militias, um, we know there's been a significant increase in domestic um, terrorism cases. Who is behind those domestic terrorism cases? The vast majority has been on the far right and the makeup of those groups has been predominantly white male Christians. Hmm. One thing I hear from a lot of our conservative members when confronted with that argument is essentially saying, well, okay, but what about the far left? What mm -hmm. about the Black Lives Matter protests yeah. over the course of the summer of 2020? What about people on social media excusing violence and looting that took place yeah. as part of those protests and claiming that in those cases, violence can be ignored. How would you respond yeah. to that critique? Yeah, well, there is there is absolutely extremism on the far left. There, um, um, and, and violent extremism on the far left has been increasing as well. Um, but if you look at the data, it's not to the same degree as the right. Um, uh, the vast, and I'm going to say the vast majority of violent attacks, the vast majority of militias in this country are far right groups. Um, you know, I, a fraction of it is on the far left. And so I think what happens is the media um, 
um, often wanting to, you know, not wanting to alienate listeners, not wanting to alienate an audience, wanting to seem balanced, will say, yes, you know, there's been an, a, there's been a, an, an attack. It's been by a far right group. They will, you know, often include a far left. But if you go to the FBI website, which keeps data on, on domestic terrorism and violent extremism, if you go to the um, Department of Homeland Security, if you go to the set, you know, there's all these think tanks who have been monitoring the violence, um, the data are very, very clear that the growth, the, the, you know, the growth has mostly been on, on the far right. The other really interesting fact is um, um, back in the 1970s, the dominant form of violent extremism here in the United States was far left violence. So if you think about um, anarchists, if you think about violent environmentalists, if you think about um, violent an animal rights groups, that, those were all far left groups. And so the, the violence in the 70s was really coming from the far left. That declined. Um, uh, pretty consistently to the point where, where much of that almost disappeared. Um, and, and what it's been replaced with is the rise of, of violence on the far right in the form of um, white supremacist groups represent, I think about 65% of, of um, militias uh, um, here in the United States, um, about 35% um, are anti-federal government groups and there's, and there's um, overlap there, but that is really where the growth has come from white supremacist groups and anti-federal government groups. The other interesting fact is it used to be that when we had a democratic president, you would see a rise in far right um, groups. And when you had a Republican president, you would see a rise in far left groups. And when a Republican president was, um, at, and, and, and so it, the groups would ebb and flow depending on whether they were basically in the opposition or not. That changed with Donald Trump. You would have thought that with the rise of Donald Trump, um, people on the far right would have felt less impetus to organize. Their man was in power, um, but actually just the opposite occurred. For the first time since data has been collected, far right groups actually increased at the same time that you had a Republican president. So that was a new phenomenon and something that, that's been quite disturbing um, because the expectation given history would have been, okay, this is when um, citizens would be less apt to organize. Um, and instead we saw the opposite. Hmm. And to what do you attribute that historical anomaly? So we, you know, we don't know. People are studying that right now. We have hunches, and one of the hunches is that that um, Donald Trump was the first president who actually said out loud what a lot of people never were willing to say, and in some ways legitimized um, white supremacy um, and hatred towards the federal government, which he was very clear and vocal vocal about. And, and, um, and I do think if you have a president who's willing to say those things, it, it does, you know, some uh, of, of his supporters are gonna come to believe that um, it's absolutely justified and legitimate to not only say the same things, but to act on, on those words. Um, and so that's what, that's what most people suspect. And what are the specific instances in which you feel like Trump legitimized white supremacy? Well, I think the one that caught everybody's attention um, the most, the, the very initial one was, well, I mean, we could, go, we could go back to when he was campaigning and he was calling Mexicans rapists. And, um, but, you know, I think a lot of people thought, okay, those are the, hyperbolic words of, of uh, a candidate who's trying to get the nomination in a very, very crowded field. And, and once, you know, if he, if he were lucky enough to become president, he's going to moderate and he's not going to say things like that anymore. Um, but, you know, one of the, the first big times when I think America really kind of were, you know, saw a president saying things that, that no president had ever said before was after the 2017 Charlottesville rally. Um, 
that was when you had um, a confluence of, of all of these different um, far right groups, many of them were white supremacist groups, coming together for the first time in Charlottesville and they were carrying torches and they were chanting um, Nazi slogans. They were chanting, we will not be replaced. We will not be replaced. Um, and um, somebody who was there um, took his car and, and plowed it into a bunch of protesters who were protesting the, the rally and killed a, a, a 30 something woman. Um, now, um, President's Trump, President Trump's response um, was, was pretty shocking. This was, you know, in some respects, you could have argued a, a neo-Nazi rally. Um, it was out in the open. Now, people have the right to, to, um, to protest here in the United States. They have a right to carry signs with neo-Nazi slogans. They have a right to chant. Um, what, whatever they want, um, they don't have a right to plow into um, uh, citizens and, and, and try to kill them. Um, but the president said um, he, he didn't condemn um, the, the people who were marching. He didn't, he didn't condemn um, this act of violence. And he said, he said, there are good people on both sides. Um, and I think that was really shocking. I, you know, I think 20 years ago, a president saying there are good people at a neo-Nazi march chanting, um, uh, you know, white supremacist slogans. Um, I, I, I think most Americans would have said, no, there's actually, you know, you can draw the line. And, and this is some place where it's actually easy to draw the line. Neo-Nazis who, who want to create a white Christian America at the exclusion of everybody else are not good people. Um, and and I, so I that was just you know one of the more shocking examples. Hmm. Well, my understanding is a lot of conservatives believe that that reading of Trump's <laughs> remarks is uh, misunderstanding, and that when he said there's very fine people on both sides, he wasn't referring to the neo Nazis, but rather was referring to people who objected to the removal of Confederate statues. And I guess it depends on how charitable you wanna to be to Donald Trump. And I'm trying to represent the views of a lot of our conservative members because they think that that's an example of the media deliberately twisting the president's words to reinforce uh, narrative. My personal view is that Trump has certainly nodded and winked at white supremacist tropes throughout his political career, but I also wanted to make sure that I'm fairly representing the opinions of a lot of our conservative members. Yeah. And so I don't think we need to parse uh, the transcript necessarily on this podcast, but I thought I'd be remiss if I yeah. didn't mention that. And I you know I, that's a, actually quite a quite a good point. You know, who really knows what Trump meant? You know, if we were sitting here with a, a glass of wine um, and uh, you know just having an uh, a, a, a off the record conversation, I would. You know, I'm like, I don't actually know what Donald Trump really, really thinks. Um, I, I actually don't know if he's racist or not. I, I don't know if he, if he actually believes any of the things that he says. I do know that he, he wants and thrives on power. Um, and he's, uh, and my guess is he's willing to say and do whatever he needs to say and do to get there. So, so who the hell knows what Donald Trump actually thinks? Um, and, and who the hell knows what he actually thought about the people who were um, there in Charlottesville in 2017. But what we do know are um, what the patterns of behavior are that have emerged in the United States since then. I, I mentioned earlier, we know that far right wing groups have have grown and have grown substantially and and this started with with Obama um, becoming president in 2008 but it continued and then accelerated 
with, with Donald Trump. That's unprecedented. We know that there has been a significant increase in hate crimes, um, whether it's directed at Latinos or, or African Americans or, or Asians. Um, that's new, and, and that's, that's happened since um, the emergence of, of Donald Trump and, and the MAGA movement. Um, if you look at um, domestic terrorism, um, uh, that's increased substantially. Again, that, that also coincides with the rise of, of Donald Trump. So, you know, whether he means it or not, whether the, the liberal media is twisting his words or not, um, it's being interpreted by American citizens in a particular way that's, that's having really dangerous and deleterious effects um, on the cohesion of our society um, and, and on, you know, even just basic civility. Mm. Yeah, well, I do believe that Trump has permissioned violence in many of his statements. Yeah. I think there's a lot of conservatives who would point to examples of people on the left that they feel have done the same, but certainly Joe Biden has explicitly condemned violence throughout his presidency. And I see that as a marked contrast with President Trump. Although I will note that Biden's recent speech in which he was standing behind those red lights yeah. and- uh, the Marines was, that was very, that was an odd choice, I agree. Yeah, and I think a lot of people interpreted Biden's remarks as accusing a significant percentage of Americans as essentially being fascist. And I wonder how the escalating rhetoric on both sides will fuel or ideally not fuel violence in upcoming elections in the midterms and heading into 2024. One question that occurs to me is what exactly qualifies as political violence? Does <laughs> looting qualify? Does property damage qualify? Does, you know, a bombing of a building where you know no people yeah. will be there qualify? <laughs> what What is political violence? Yeah. So, I mean, political violence is a very, very vague term. Um, so let's just start with civil war, which people, people have an image of what a civil war is like. Um, and I guess there's two points I wanna make about that. Um, the way that political scientists and the people who study this and the people who are collecting the data on it, um, they, civil wars come in two types. There could be minor civil wars and major civil wars. Um, and even the major civil wars are, are, are the threshold to, to be a major civil war is still quite low. All, all a major civil war has to do is it has to be a war fought between um, <clears throat> a domestic group um, and the government um, for political purposes. And it has to cause a thousand battle deaths per year. That's major. A minor civil war um, only has to cause 25 battle deaths a year. Um, so um, it, it actually doesn't take a lot to, to get into the data set. Um, in, in a country like the United States, whose population is so large, you know, we, we probably, by the, that definition, have, have reached a, a minor civil war. Uh, um, we, we reach that threshold um, not infrequently. Um, but the second big point I wanted to make is um, that when people think about civil wars here in the United States, they, they have a very 1860s vision of a civil war. They think about our civil war, um, which was an old schooly type of civil war where you have two big armies. They each have their own uniforms. They're dragging cannons. Um, they're, they're meeting each other on these large battlefields. And that is just not the 21st century type of civil war. If another civil war happens here in the United States, it will absolutely not look like that. Um, and it will especially not look like that because um, uh, if you're a rebel group and you wanna take on, on the government, you want, you wanna create, you wanna cause some major change. Um, you don't 
you don't want to directly challenge a really powerful military. You know, the U.S. military in, in the 1850s was, was almost laughably weak. Um, you know, it had 16,000 soldiers. That's it. They were stationed mostly out west to put down Indian uprisings. The Confederate states actually were militarily quite strong. There were lots and lots of militias in the Confederate states. Um, and they'd been there for decades and they had been created to put down slave uprisings. So when the South declared um, independence, all they had to do were take all of these militias, bring them together, and they had their own standing Confederate army and they're facing a federal, you know, a, a US military of 16,000 soldiers who were not prepared. Um, compare that to today, um, where the US has over 2 million soldiers under arms. It has the ability to transport these soldiers very rapidly wherever it wants. You are not going to win a war against this military. And so what we're gonna see is a type of insurgency. Um, that's going to look more like guerrilla warfare. It's going to look more like, um, you know, sieges of terror. Um, violence is going to be directed not at the U.S. government, but at civilians, at minority groups, at opposition leaders. You'll see assassinations being used, hit and run attacks of infrastructure. Um, it's going to be very decentralized. And in fact, the, the far right has a name for this type of warfare and they outline what it's going to look like. And it's called leaderless resistance. Um, it's kind of classic uh, cell warfare from, from, from uh, you know, terrorism. Um, so if, if we see another civil war here in the United States, it's going to look like that. Hmm. Well, based on how you're talking about it, it seems like you are fairly confident that it is going to happen. No, I actually I'm not. Um, one I, again, you know, the, the goal of the task force was if we can identify the countries with these risk factors, it gives us time to do something to to prevent violence from actually breaking out and and you know, one of the heartening things about um, the reception of my book, I, I actually thought nobody was going to read it. Um, <laughs> and it was just going to be lost in, in a sea of other of other books, but but it has resonated with the American public and with politicians. And that what's heartening about that is, um, you know, they now know what the risk factors are. They now know that if we don't strengthen our democracy, um, if, if our political parties refuse to reach across racial and religious lines, if we don't reform, um, then our risk of civil war is going to increase every year. Um, you know, on the task force, if you have these two factors, we know you have about a 4% annual risk of civil war, 4% annual. That seems small, but it actually is not. It means that every year that these two features continue to exist, it goes up 4%. So after 10 years, the risk is 40%. After 20 years, the risk is 80%. Um, and so, you know, we have this unique opportunity. We have this information. We know what will, what will reduce the risk, what will make us safer. And, and, and now it's really contingent on us as citizens and then our, our politicians um, to take the measures necessary to reduce the risk. Hmm. And in terms of defining an act that is an example of political violence, I have a couple of examples and I'm curious to hear what you think. If I go out and I set a parked police car on fire, is that something that would be considered a, an act of political violence? Ah, well, I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I, in the short answer is, I don't know. We don't actually talk about it in terms of political violence. So there's no definition of political violence. I, I guess, you know, uh, the way we would analyze it is, was there a political motive behind it? Were you 
Uh, were you attacking the police car because he gave you a ticket and you're seeking revenge? Not political violence. Mm. Are you attacking the police car because you're an anarchist and you believe that um, you know nobody should have higher authority over you? That's political. That's politically motivated and politically based. So it really it would depend on what your motive was um, and what your you know what your motivation behind it was. Hmm. So like you can, if you kill an abortion doctor, it could be that, um, you know, they, they, they engaged in malpractice against your, your daughter and you're angry, right? Or it could be that you fundamentally dis, you, you fundamentally disagree with the federal government's ruling that there should be access to abortion and you're taking matters into your own, own hands and and essentially um, enforcing your your own political ideology um, um, on on this doctor that's political violence. Where's the form? Mm. That's very clarifying. Well, in our last time here, let's move a little from the doom and gloom to potential rays of hope and potential yeah. solutions. First, from your studying in other countries. What have you seen work in terms of stemming the tide of morally abhorrent political violence and civil war? Yeah, I, you know, the best example is South Africa. Um, and I tell the story of South Africa in the very <clears throat> last chapter. Um, it, you know, in the 1980s, I remember being in a college class <clears throat> on international relations. And we were, the, the professor said to the class, you know, if you if you were going to predict where around the world, what country was most likely to explode in civil war, what would it be? And we all agreed it was going to be South Africa. Like we had no doubt. And, and the professor agreed with us. Yes. And and it was because South Africa was barreling down the road towards civil war. It had this white minority regime. Um, that was facing an increasingly vocal <clears throat> and angry black majority population. Um, there were increasing peaceful protests by the black majority. They were modeling it on the civil rights movement here in the United States. And rather than um, begin to reform, the white minority regime doubled down. Um, they started to become more repressive. They started to engage in, in more brutal tactics. Um, you know, if you, if you think back to the Soweto, riots and, and, and think back to, oh, you know, that fateful day when a when hundred and something school children were mowed down um, in the streets as they were peacefully protesting. I mean, they, they were just willing to use scorched earth tactics to maintain their hold on power. And then they suddenly changed. And de Klerk came into power and Nelson Mandela was released from prison. And very quickly, you had this transfer of power to the black majority. That was massive democratic reform. And so the question is, why did that happen? Like, why would this brutal white apartheid regime suddenly um, change its position? And it wasn't because they suddenly gained a conscience. Um, it was because the white business community Business was dominated by, by um, whites in South Africa. And the white business community was being increasingly hurt by <clears throat> economic sanctions. The United States, Japan, and the European community, the three biggest trading partners of South Africa, had all put massive economic sanctions on the country. And it was strangling the economy. And the business leaders um, eventually figured out that they could either have profits or they could have apartheid, but they could not have both. And they chose profits. And they told the white apartheid regime that they were no longer going to support it. Um, and as soon as that happened, they knew the game was over. And so you had this situation where, <clears throat> where the business community actually came together and said, this is not sustainable. Um, this has to change. And they whipped through their support and that created um, the incentives or they, it created no other option for white politicians than to say, okay, 
we are in fact going to have to agree to majority rule and we have to dismantle this minority system. Hmm. Well, well, one could make the argument also that there's some irony because it wasn't until the ANC moved from purely peaceful civil disobedience to more <laughs> aggressive acts of violent resistance and bombings that they then engendered the more violent backlash from the regime that drew the international attention needed to yeah. enforce the sanctions. Yeah, well, and then also what this is signaling to the business community is that this is going towards civil war. And if we have a civil war, it's going to be incredibly costly for the South African economy, uh, which we know is, you know, the economies tend to grind to a halt, not just during the civil war, but they, they, they tend to experience economic decline, you know, even after a civil, a civil war. So the business community is just facing a situation where this is going bad in multiple different ways. Right. So in the South African example, you have a regime that is clearly in the wrong and uh, repressed majority clamoring for rights. What are the lessons you see from that example, both in terms of the power mm -hmm. dynamic of the country, as well as the potentially constructive role of the business sector yeah. in heading off political violence when we think about the United States context? Yeah, well, there, there are lots of groups here in the United States that have been wronged, where there really is a legitimate sense of grievance. And, and you know, the, you know, during the Clinton era, when Clinton signed NAFTA, um, uh, there was so much talk about how free trade is going, you know, is going to benefit everybody that, you know, a rising tide raises all boats. Um, but, you know, those who study free trade know that they're winners and that they're losers. And, and we knew who the losers were going to be. The, the losers were going to be predominantly the white working class who had safe, stable, unionized manufacturing jobs, which allowed them to, to live a very comfortable middle-class life. NAFTA was going to uh, eliminate those jobs and that's exactly what happened. And, and there was no replacement and neither the Democrats nor the Republicans put party, uh, to put policies in place to take care of that group, the losers of the, those who really suffered the consequences of, of NAFTA. And, and they um, have been struggling. Um, you know, white working class has declined on almost every measure from marriage to drug abuse, to suicide, to life expectancy, more so than any other group. You know, even African-Americans and, and Latinos have at, at worst remained remain stable while the white working class has, has declined. Now the white working class started at a higher level, but still they, they have seen their quality of, of life decline and they have felt rightly so ignored by, by both parties. And so when you had a message um, from Trump who, who was really ab about bringing back America's greatness, about supporting um, you know, uh, whites, about fighting, fighting for, for um, for this group, it resonated with them, and they, and they became, um, you know, kind of easy, easy pickings for him. So, so you know, we have a lot of work to do in in supporting um, our most vulnerable citizens. You know, no matter what color they are, so so that they aren't, um, um, you know, that so that they 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 won't be radicalized by people sort of um, uh, preaching preaching them, you know, hope and, and a, a, a better life. Um, so, you know, that's definitely something both of our parties can do. And then, you know, the, the business community has, you know, they tend to stay on the sidelines. They tend not to want to get involved with politics. They tend to be focused on their own bottom line and, and, and they'll support whichever, whichever party will, will help them maximize them, that. Um, but you know what? I, what you are starting to see in places like Colombia and Brazil is the business community actually becoming more activist, realizing that you know if in fact um, war returns in Colombia, uh, civil war returns in Colombia, or if in fact democracy, you know Brazil becomes an autocracy, 
um, that that will affect their their bottom line. And and they are now beginning to speak up. And in Brazil, you have business leaders going on television and, and kind of doing dem democracy civics lessons saying, you know, democracy is important. Here's what you need to understand. Um, and it's countering messages uh, like like the, you know the Trump esque Bolsonaro is is sending them and and I do you know one of the things we know is that the American public does still trust business leaders they don't trust politicians they don't trust um, you, you know academics but but they trust business leaders and so business leaders have the ability and the forum um, to to serve as um, you know a counter to to the messages that they're hearing from people who would who would like to unravel our democracy and 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 who think violence might be justified. Hmm. And aside from our leaders and the business community, what can we as citizens do to preserve and strengthen our democratic system, which is an alternative <laughs> to violence for working out our differences? Well, I mean, Better Angels is is doing important work by just bringing together people and. You know, Americans are, we all love our country. Um, we all want what's best for our country. Um, and, and we all are more similar than we are different. And just bringing people together is really, really valuable. Um, but then also vote. I mean, uh, vote, 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 vote. Um, you know, people think about Tennessee as a deep red country, uh, a deep red state. Um, and we actually don't know if Tennessee is a red or a blue state. We all we know is that Tennessee is a non-voting state. And you could say this about most states in the country. Um, in the, the last primary in, in Tennessee, I think only about 20% of eligible voters voted. 20%, that means 80% of eligible voters are standing on the sideline. Um, and so think about that. If those people um, did become involved, did exercise their right to vote, the outcomes we would get at the national level and at the state level would be radically different and it might create a situation where real reform could take place. It's interesting to think about building a citizens movement of people who disagree with one another, but through their trust and relationships might agree upon structural reforms to yeah. our democracy the rules yeah. of the game, so to speak, yeah. that could actually help us choose democracy over violence. So I think that's a good point to end on. Again, Barbara Walter is an author, an academic, and a political scientist. Her new book is called How Civil Wars Start and How to Stop Them. You can find it online. It's on Amazon. You can email me to tell me what you thought about this episode at media at braverangels.org. And we will see you next time on the Braver Angels podcast.